State of Iowa for November 16th, uh, 2018 will come to order. I will begin by calling the roll. Uh, Regent Bates. Present. And we know that Regent Butcher is here, but I'll recognize her when she is, returns. Regent County. Here. Regent Dokovich. Present. Regent Dunkel. Here. Regent Johnson. Present. Regent Lindemeyer. Here. Regent McKibben. Present. Regent Richards is present. We have a quorum and the meeting can begin. Uh, we now uh, recognize that Regent Butker has joined us. Are there items that, uh, on the consent agenda, are there items the board members would like to remove from the consent agenda for a separate vote? A motion and a second are required to approve and receive items on the cons consent agenda. So moved. I'll second. Regent McKibben and Regent uh, Dunkel. A motion was made by Regent uh, McKibben and a second by Regent Dunkel. Any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent County? Yes. Regent Dokovich? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Johnson? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent McKibben? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Now we'll begin by, with uh, reports from the institutional heads. And uh, we are at UNI, and I'd first like to recognize President uh, Duck. Thank you, very, thank you very much, and welcome to the University of Northern Iowa. Regents, uh, members of the media, our colleagues from uh, around the state of Iowa and community members, it's great to have you on our campus and enjoy having you here. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about UNI. As you know, we have a strategic plan that's focused around the success of our students as well as diversity and inclusivity, campus vitality, and community engagement. Uh, just yesterday, a new website became active that uh, is around our strategic plan and in particular shows all of our goals and the metrics that we're using to track our, our success and, and how we're doing in meeting those goals. At our next meeting, I'll make that uh, website available and probably talk to you about a few things that are on there, but it just became live kind of as we were meeting yesterday. To begin, I'd like to talk about a, a few of our current, two of our current students, Laura Lopez and Shalyn Taylor. Laura is a senior majoring in global marketing in our College of Business Administration. Um, this summer, she completed a, an internship in global banking with Bankers Trust. Um, she had a remarkable time there. While she was working with them, um, she was involved in creating databases and researching compliance uh, requirements for return merchandise authorization. Laura, however, is also very involved in her community. Laura has volunteered in the Latino community, not only here in the Cedar Valley and, and at the University of Northern Iowa, but really across the state. She's also been active with the Des Moines Area Community College Latino group and for Latinos Unidos uh, throughout Iowa. In the future, when she graduates this next spring, she would like to travel and actually live for a period of time in another country to really understand their culture. She's a remarkable young woman and we're proud to call her a panther. Shalyn Taylor is a sophomore um, that is originally from Cedar Rapids and this summer she was an intern at the African American Museum of Iowa, which is located in Cedar Rapids. In her role at the library, uh, excuse me, in her role at the museum this year, she managed the museum's social media accounts, developed marketing materials, and writing press and wrote press releases. She also hosted many events, speakers, and educational programs. One of her big efforts this year was to work with the education department in revamping the museum's Journey to Freedom program which occurred this September, and it is an interactive simulation of the Underground Railroad and 
uh, where, where participants actually traveled back in time to become a runaway slave. A very interesting program. Uh, Shalin is also very active in um, uh, community endeavors as well. We have two of our alums that I would like to tell you a little bit about as well, Cody Wilson and Grant Menke, both graduated in 2002. Cody graduated um, from UNI with a degree in physics and now works for Passport Systems Incorporated as a, an experimental scientist, research scientist. Uh, he's the director of R&D for Passport Systems. Uh, Passport Systems is a little bit unique. It was a, uh, a business that was created in 2002 following the terrorist attacks and grew out of the terrorist attacks. What they do is to use nuclear resonance fluorescence technology to figure out what's inside a vehicle without looking inside the vehicle. And so they're really looking for contraband, as is pointed out in this image below. Um, they can target tobacco, C4 explosives, cocaine, other items that um, really don't want coming into the country or this vehicle isn't licensed to carry into the country or to move around the country. It's really remarkable work. Uh, Cody was back uh, just over a year ago to speak to our physics department and let them know about the research he's doing. But in ad addition to his very successful career um, uh, with Passport Systems, he also serves as a big brother for Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Massachusetts. And uh, uh, he has been very active in that program even while he was here at, on campus. Grant Mankey, which we see on the right here, is a political science and humanities double major back in 2002 and is a native of Calumet, Iowa. I think there's probably four people in the room that might know where Calumet is. Calumet is located exactly 32 miles north of Holstein, so now everyone knows where it is. But, um, <laughs> Grant uh, oversees the, Grant was just named the state director for the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Development in Iowa by President Donald Trump. He started August 6th. He oversees the U.S. Department, USDA's Rural Development Leadership Team that's based in Des Moines and uh, oversees several other employees across Iowa and the various businesses, communities, and programs the organization has implemented statewide. The organization has a total of 72 employees in 11 offices across the state and serves approximately 1.7 million Iowans living in rural Iowa communities. After graduating from UNI, Menke moved to Washington, D.C. for approximately seven years, and he had two very distinctive career paths while he was there. First, he served um, as Senator Chuck Grassley's aide to the U.S. Senate Committee on Finance. Um, and he served as an umpire for minor league baseball games for roughly seven years. The last time that uh, I presented to you, we talked a little bit about the enrollments and where our enrollments were going and the, some of the things that we were doing to try to improve our enrollments. I'd like to update you on a few of those. We're very early in the admission cycle, as you heard earlier. Um, we're at the point where we have a lot of applications in. We're starting to admit those students, but we really won't start to enroll them until end of the summer. Um, so we're talking right now mostly about applications and what's happening with the applications that we've received. Uh, first of all, um, our enrollment management uh, director, Matt Krager, talked to you a little bit about this partnership between UNI Admissions and the University's Center for Urban Education. The Center for Urban Education has been very aggressive in contacting high school counselors and bringing students to our campus. And you can see a busload of them here uh, on the right side that came in from Dubuque Hempstead. Uh, to date, they've scheduled more than 2,900 students to visit our campus. Part of this uh, program is also um, the Panther Promise program, which is designed to bring especially low income and minority and other underserved groups to our campus. To date, more than 761 students from 15 different high schools have been scheduled to meet on our campus. And we brought several of those in already. More visits are scheduled. At this point, due in large part to the work of the Panther Promise program, uh, we have an 81% increase in the applications from racial and ethnic minorities on our campus. Now, as we bring these students to campus uh, while they're here, 
they fill out and complete their application process. So it has greatly helped us with our, our applications, uh, especially in for minority and other underserved um, students. We have a, a total increase. In our freshman applications are up by 7% at this point compared to this time last year, and our transfer applications are up by about 23% at, uh, compared to this time last year. So our outreach efforts are at the moment working by the only measure we have available to us. Uh, of course, the real the important thing now is to turn those applications into enrolled students and ultimately into graduates of the University of Northern Iowa. This past May, I had the opportunity to meet with Allen College President Jared Selinger and sign a memorandum of understanding that allows graduate students at both of our institutions to better prepare for the management of Iowa's healthcare industry. Now, it sounds like Jared and I worked this all out and sent things out, but the real hard work, the really hard work, was performed by Provost Walpart, Dean Wilson, and the faculty and staff of the College of uh, Business Administration. And Jared and I get to show, show up and sign the document and have our pictures taken, but there's so much work that goes into getting one of these documents prepared and laying the educational programs together. The way that this program is uh, designed to work is that students that already have a master's of nursing degree or are enrolled in one of Allen College's master's of nursing programs can take courses in our MBA program and if they take 15 credits they will get the endorsement in healthcare administration to go along with it. In addition, any of our students that are in the MBA program can take courses in their master's of nursing program that leads to a, a certificate then in uh, healthcare management. So it's a great cooperative program between us and Allen College. We've worked with Allen College for several years in developing nursing programs. Many students start here and go to, to Allen College to complete a nursing degree. So it's been a great partnership. Uh, and this is just another example of working together to meet one of Iowa's most critical healthcare needs. In the last month, there have been two major community events on our camp, uh, uh, in, our, in our community that were sponsored and supported in large part by the University of Northern Iowa. Uh, the first of those is the Future Ready Iowa Regional Summit that was held here in Cedar Falls uh, earlier this week. We had more than 300 participants attend the summit, and we focused on four primary targets, increase, uh, topics increasing the registered apprenticeships, addressing the skills gap, overcoming barriers to employment, and elevating lifelong learning. It was an incredible, really day-long um, summit with participants from all um, industrial and economic sectors, uh, including education. Um, it was uh, really pulled together in large part with the work of uh, Provost Jim Walpart. He's been serving as our representative on Future Ready Iowa, uh, really since its inception. And so there was, it was really good to see the level of participation from the community colleges in the area, private colleges, public higher ed, um, as well as then the various industries and, and businesses in the community. Uh, the other program, Engage Empower Act, is the Cedar Valley Conference on um, Economic Inclusion. Here more than 400 participants uh, uh, were at the conference. They learned best practices in growing their businesses inclusively, especially increasing the number of employees and understanding that it is important to the bottom line of their businesses and their industries to, in, to increase the diversity and the inclusivity of their businesses and industries. Um, and it's very important to their bottom line. Very, very successful summit. Finally, um, we had a, an alumni event at Principal Financial. Um, Principal Financial is an extremely important partner to us here at the University of Northern Iowa. We have 776 alums at Principal Financial. That represents about 12% of their workforce. Um, we aren't the largest higher ed institution that they recruit from, but they have said, as a percentage of alumni base, you're by far the largest we hire from. Um, and they hire technologists, they hire um, uh, accountants, and other financial professionals out of our various programs. 
we had an alumni event down there. They opened up their campus for us so that we could meet with their alums, talk with their alums, and we could get a good tour of the, the remodeled and renovated uh, campus down in the Des Moines area. It was a wonderful afternoon. There was a lot of purple um, uh, on display that day in and around uh, the um, uh, principal campus. Just a wonderful opportunity to celebrate the things that they've done for us. They were big investors in many of our programs in the College of, of uh, Business uh, Administration, but they were also have helped us out with our computer science and actuarial programs as well. So uh, a real partnership with uh, the Principal Financial. With that, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to present to you today and to host you on our campus. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Regent Butker. Thank you. I just have one question on admissions. Um, when you talk about uh, the time frame, do we have a lot of students who are juniors in high school that then are getting accepted by, you talked about spring or May or something, and yep. is that juniors? I mean, that's, that seems kind of late for seniors. Yeah, we most, about 50% of all of our applications from current high school seniors are in by the end of October. So we're over halfway through if everything follows the typical path. <laughs> uh -huh. um, high school juniors aren't being admitted yet. We do have them on campus, and uh, we are including them in many of these campus visits, but that, the, their applications will open up at a later date. So um, that application process starts next fall, well, actually late next summer. So in the fall of yep. senior year. Okay. Yep, hmm. yep. But we, we certainly need to be working on getting them to understand what our campus is and what it's like and getting them on our campus. One of the reasons that we really want to work not only with juniors and seniors but also sophomores is the longer that a student has had a relationship with a university, not only is it more likely that they'll come, but it's more, much, much more likely that they will be retained and actually graduate. Um, if they come to your campus and you've been speaking with them for three or more years, they feel like they have a relationship. They do have a relationship with you, mm -hmm. and they're much, much more likely to, to ret be retained to that second year and ultimately graduate. Great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks mm -hmm. for hosting us. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we, we'd like to recognize uh, uh, Superintendent Gettle. As uh, Steve walks up, uh, I want to uh, also rec give a, uh, another recognition, which is that the board would like to publicly congratulate uh, Superintendent Gettle for receiving the prestigious William H. English Leadership Award last month at the annual meeting of the Council of Schools and Services for the Blind. Uh, this award is presented annually to just one educational administrator in the entire United States from the blind and visually impaired programs. Uh, congratulations, Steve, uh, on this uh, tremendous honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And it's uh, really, I'm just a uh, Grateful to have the opportunity to reflect the good work of so many other people that have mentored and helped me to become somebody that has value to the education of kids here in Iowa. <clears throat> good morning, uh, President Richards and members of the board. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to share information on three items today, and they're all related to um, our school improvement efforts at ISD and ISBVI. <clears throat> The uh, first thing I want to talk about was um, a research project uh, that the Iowa School for the Deaf has been involved with. Um, this is our second year, and it's around um, helping develop an assessment tool that uh, can be used for progress monitoring and informing instruction that uh, is specifically designed and validated for deaf and hard of hearing children. Um, while common core standards and adequate yearly progress mandates have been designed and implemented to close the achievement gap, uh, the impact on deaf, hard, and hearing students hasn't been realized. And as recently as 2012, 
it was estimated that 70% of the 6 million deaf and hard of hearing students in the country did not meet grade level expectations on state assessments. Formative assessments like a Northwest uh, edu Evaluation Association's uh, Measure of Academic Progress, or MAP, you've probably heard of that assessment. Many districts use it, we use it at ISD. Um, we, we have been using that for about four years and, and uh, routinely th these kinds of measurements are used to assess measures of oral reading fluency, uh, phoneme identification, letter sound association, and they're invalid when you apply them to a group of students who learn visually and use sign language as a mode of communication. Um, at ISD, we've used MAP in grades three through 11 for reading comprehension um, because the results are invalid for many deaf students. We've stopped using the FAST or the formative assessment uh, that's used for early literacy implementation across the state. And um, so we're looking for some other tool that would help us to measure the progress and growth of our students. Um, so funded by a grant from OSEP, uh, Office of Special Education Programs, the there's a learning design and, um, and technology program at Penn State and they developed a curriculum based on online assessments that are um, supported for both children that learn auditorily and through visual communication modes like ASL. Um, they have a progress monitoring capability and they help teachers track literacy development of students with hearing loss. It's called Avenue PM. I think the PM means progress monitoring, but nobody told me that, I'm just guessing. Uh, anyway, it's a suite of four different assessments that measure reading and writing aptitude specifically designed to provide our teachers, teachers of deaf and hard of hearing, valid, robust, and meaningful data and reliable measure of uh, student growth that hasn't been available in our field up to this point. So at ISD, we're currently using Avenue PM as a writing assessment with high school students. You can use it in grades K through 12. And uh, we're also adding two additional assessments for reading. Uh, we'll be progress monitoring in four areas when we're um, finally f fully implementing the program for reading, picture and letter naming with younger students, language use, reading and sign, sign language fluency, the fluency of the use of ASL and reading comprehension. Uh, this school year, ISD is assisting with research to support the ongoing development and validation of Avenue PM. And we're partnering with the Learning Design Technology Program and, and the University of Minnesota by participating in a professional development to learn how to utilize the assessment tools with students, interpret and apply the data to instruction, uh, participate in focus groups, with the test developers and colleagues across the country uh, to discuss the implications of the intervention strategies that are being used. And uh, there are a lot of different intervent intervention strategies or reading programs that are used around the country, so it gives it a chance to um, pair the assessment tool with the curriculum that's being used and see if we can identify some that are more effective than others. And then our teachers will get a chance to make recommendations for improvements to the developers. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about was a classroom at St. Ansgar, and that's up in kind of north, central, east, almost to the Minnesota border, I think. Uh, I haven't been there yet, but uh, St. Ansgar, Howard, Winnesheck, Garner, Hayfield, Ventura, and Clear Lake school districts along with Central Rivers and Keystone AEAs and IESBVI um, have collaborated this year to provide half-day services in a classroom with a teacher of visually impaired for three elementary students that are all living within a 50-mile radius of St. Ansgar. The students from um, Howard Winnesheck and Garner Hayfield are transported to St. Ansgar every morning by their paraeducators who are, also, who are employed by their local districts. Uh, and then the ISBVI teacher provides daily direct instruction in the expanded core curriculum with the IEP goals primarily for pre-Braille uh, and Braille literacy and to support reading and writing, assistive technology, sensory and, uh, efficiencies and, and social and recreation skills. 
In the afternoon, the students are integrated in general education classrooms for their core academics and instruction by our orientation mobility teacher. Uh, the teacher of the visually impaired and orientation mobility specialist provides support to the paraeducators and the general education teachers, and all three students have support from a paraeducators throughout the day. By providing intensive instruction in skills that are integral part of the expanded core curriculum, the expectation is that students will be able to function more independently in middle school, uh, preparing themselves for success after high school. This is a unique opportunity that evolved through interest of the school districts and the administrators in those school districts, and it really closely mirrors what our idea was for having a regional program in Charles City. It just didn't happen there. It just happens to be in St. Ansgar for these three students. And then finally, uh, I want to talk about IESBVI professional development. We believe we have a really good model for professional development programming, um, and we've changed our focus this year. Over the past four years, uh, it's been focused on the expanded core areas of compensatory or functional academic skills, and that includes communication modes, things like a Braille and Nemeth code that support uh, learning in the core curriculum. Um, we also were focused on orientation mobility and assistive technology. Um, but there are nine areas of the ECC, and so we've moved on now uh, to the other six areas. We have standards of practice that are developed for all nine areas. Um, this year, the work is going to be focused on uh, the remaining areas, which are social interaction, independent living, recreation and leisure, career education, sensory efficiency, and self-determination or self-advocacy skills. And those don't sound like history, math, science, but we go in and support um, the areas that kids would typically learn by seeing and being involved in those experiences because we have to intentionally instruct those things. But they all support learning in the, in the core curriculum. Um, and our, our staff would self-assess in each of those six standards of practice areas, determine what areas their kids that they're going to serve this year are going to need uh, support in, and that's how they would decide where to track. And we had uh, professional development activities that are guided by content experts that we brought in, have contracted with. Um, in those areas, we've divided it up primarily in the areas of independent living um, and then uh, recreation, leisure, and we actually, one of the content experts is from UNI that's helping with recreation and leisure. And then uh, the uh, other areas of uh, self-determination, self-advocacy. What, what we do with our staff then is um, they'll spend time with the content experts, but they'll be focused on um, participating using video recording, self-reflection, group and individual feedback, coaching, and measures of student outcomes um, to improve their teaching practices. After our initial meeting in the fall, um, where they spent a, a day with the content experts in their large groups, uh, they will now meet uh, once a month with our staff consultants and the, and the content experts uh, to share, reflect, learn, and plan evidence-based instruction strategies, video those, get back together, and then in groups, um, analyze how they've done, what kind of progress they're making with their teaching, um, and the effectiveness then ma 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 um, matching that up with assessments that they have of student progress. And uh, that's uh, all I have to share with you this afternoon, do you or this morning. Do you have any questions? I'd be happy to answer them. Does anyone have any questions for Superintendent Gell? Right, thank you. Th thank you. And at this time, I'd like to recognize uh, President Winterstein. It's a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to share some wonderful stories about the success of Iowa State University. 
Isn't that a pretty picture? You can see it as well as I can see it on my screen, but a lovely fall day. We didn't have very many of those. Well, as you know, in late September, I was honored to be installed, and many of you were there uh, to celebrate with Iowa State University, and it really was a special day. I want to thank President Nook and President Harold for being there. Uh, that was uh, a nice part of the experience. And it was really a celebration of Iowa State University and all the people who work hard every day uh, to help us achieve excellence in our teaching, research, and extension programs. And if you look at the lower left of the slide, you can see that that's a photo from our homecoming celebration. Uh, this was our third annual homecoming parade that's in Main Street on downtown a Ames. Uh, it was a great uh, week of celebration. Uh, one of the skits put on by a fraternity uh, was all about uh, Texas Tech being so worried that they were going to lose the game that they had to take President Winterstein hostage. <laughs> so that was fun, and I got to meet the actress who played me in that uh, event. Uh, the middle slides uh, show our 87th annual honors and awards ceremony where we honor the achievements and contributions of our alumni and, uh, and then of course go on to have a great football game and Texas Tech did need to be worried. Uh, uh, right here in the middle on the lower slide is a cyclone sweep by our men and women's cross country teams each capturing the Big 12 conference cross country uh, championship title. And they also each took first place at the NCAA Midwestern Regional Championship just last week. So another great victory uh, for that uh, group of student athletes. Here on the right, you can see some photos from what we do at Iowa State for the World Food Prize. We always host the 2018 World Food Prize laureates on campus for the annual Norman Borlaug Lecture. And I was honored to moderate this session this year. We had a great discussion with Dr. Lawrence Haddad and Dr. David Nabarro. Uh, both of these individuals were honored for their work in nutrition, child nutrition and maternal nutrition, uh, just two extraordinary individuals. Uh, this work, uh, or rather this event, also included the Borlaug poster competition for our graduate and undergraduate students engaged in researching world food issues. So the World Food Prize, a great stage for Iowa to be lifted up to the nation and the world. One of my top priorities as president is to make Iowa State the national leader in having a welcoming and inclusive campus environment and we were pleased to partner with the city of Ames and Story County on this shared priority. And just recently, we took a, another step forward in this partnership. On October 31st, we held the inaugural symposium on building inclusive organizations. The event was designed for leaders and influencers, particularly those who impact hiring and decision making in the workplace and who impact organizational culture and environment. It provided practical strategies for building more inclusive workplace, workplaces. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, keynote speaker, Joe Gerstadt, uh, who's a nationally known leader in helping organizations understand diversity and inclusion. He talked about a great story where orchestras across the nation were criticized by uh, the white males that predominantly uh, are in the orchestras. And so they did an effort to demonstrate this unconscious bias that we all have. And so what they did is they put up screens so that the evaluators could not see who was playing. And that didn't make a lot of difference. But then they decided to make everybody walk across the stage barefoot. And as soon as the women took off their high heels, all of a sudden they started to see a different set of individuals being selected to be in the orchestras. So these are the kind of conversations that really change what an organization looks like. Again, a partnership between Iowa State University, the city of Ames, and Story County. 
Have you heard from Chief Newton about all the things we're doing to have a safe campus at Iowa State University? And I won't repeat all of that, but I'll bring you down to the last bullet there on our green dot training. So over 2,500 faculty and staff and students have completed that training, and it really trains bystanders to know when can I intervene, when do I need to call for help, and this is a very important uh, program. Uh, if you watch any Cyclone football, you'll see that our players' helmets all have a green dot on them. And that's just a measure of the interest, the student-led visibility of this important program. Well, mental health issues uh, are pervasive on college campuses nationwide, and we know that that's, Iowa State is no exception to that. We now have the opportunity to be at the leading edge of preventing suicide and substance abuse issues that impact college students. Our Student Health and Wellness Unit has been award, awarded the Garrett Lee Smith Campus Suicide Prevention Grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. This three-year, 306,000 grant will strengthen our work in preventing suicide and substance abuse. The funds will support a suicide and substance abuse prevention coordinator who will work jointly with all the departments in our student health and wellness unit, as well as campus partners and the Ames community. Well, uh, last week I had the opportunity to be with Regent McKibben in Marshalltown. We had a wonderful visit uh, at uh, high school with juniors and seniors talking about coming to college and I spoke at the Marshalltown Rotary. We had a very good uh, time. One of the things that I talked about was the unique role that Iowa State plays as a land-grant university and how it benefits every community in our state. Uh, specifically, when the Marshalltown, uh, when the tornado hit Marshalltown back in July, the university stepped up through our research, extension, and service missions to offer support and resources and to learn from this disaster to better prepare and respond to future disasters. The day after the storm, for example, Iowa State's Small Business Development Center arrived to lend support. They held office hours and attended meetings with small business owners affected by the storm. They assisted with data collection and best practices research, and they assisted in the process for post-storm disaster loan program. We also have a faculty member, Sarah uh, Hamadé, who's featured, shown over there on the left of the slide, and she's examining how tornado affected different types of households, particularly immigrant households and renters. And we believe that her work will further help the country better understand what needs to be done in terms of disaster recovery uh, for those members of our community. And then on the right, uh, even the Cyclone football team pitched in, and we were so proud that they took time out to go over and spend a day in Marshalltown uh, with their coach, uh, Matt Campbell, to really help uh, start the cleanup effort. Well, you often hear us say that Iowa State is a 99-county campus, and it's true. Our extension and outreach programs provide a front door to the university in every single county with direct access to our research and our expertise. And to help shape the future of extension, Vice President for Extension and Outreach, John Lawrence, has been on a statewide listening tour. And over the past five months, he's met with our partners, our staff, uh, elected extension council members in 20 locations and has heard from 1,200 individuals. He's also meeting with individuals on campus as well. He's initiated a Structured for Success Committee that is studying our current organizational structure uh, to evaluate how we can even better serve Iowa through our extension and outreach efforts. Research and innovation is integral in our role as a leading land-grant university, and as a research one institution, we're engaged in high-impact research that addresses complex global challenges with major societal impact. The faculty pictured here were awarded grants this year as part of our internal presidential research initiatives. Uh, these include the Presidential Interdisciplinary Research Initiative, which aims to promote a culture of large-scale interdisciplinary research, 
and support teams to aspire to new discoveries and technical developments that really have significant impact. The Presidential Interdisciplinary Research Seed Grant Program is designed to help form new research efforts, really early stage, innovative, high risk efforts, uh, bringing different disciplines together to collaborate. And the importance of bridging the divide seed funding program seeks to holistically address complex societal challenges. And it also supports transdisciplinary teams who really build long-term collaborations to address new intellectual pursuits at the interface of, dis of disciplines. And finally, we have the importance of building Iowa State and University of Iowa Research Partnership Seed Grant Program. This program is spurring greater collaboration between bioscience researchers at Iowa State and at Iowa, the University of Iowa. The research applications will advance key areas that align with the state's economic priorities in the biosciences, including our strengths in bio-based chemicals, precision and digital agriculture, and vaccines and immunotherapeutics. This ties directly to Iowa State University and I University of Iowa's joint fiscal year 20 economic development legislative request of $4 million in reoccurring appropriations to position us to help the state grow in these areas. Um, and finally, I'd like to share with you that uh, just this week we ended up with I'm going to count them here, seven members of the faculty be named uh, as AAAS fellows, uh, Dr. Vella, Dr. Yu, Dr. Zhang, Dr. Adams, Dr. Jansen, Dr. Johansson, uh, Dr. Kuar, uh, and this is certainly a measure of their excellence to be elected as fellows. Uh, I brought more information about the research programs that I just described, and, and I'll just hand these, and maybe you take one if you're if you're interested. And then going on uh, to how research really translates into the economy, a little bit about what's happening at the research park. So over the past few months, these three industry giants have established or expanded their presence at the ISU Research Park. Uh, both Rockwell Collins and Kent Corporation have oper opened new offices, and John Deere recently broke ground on a new 33,000 square foot design and test lab at the park. Their participation at the park is clearly connected to their interest in talent, the undergraduates that they can hire after graduating from Iowa State, and to our innovative faculty. Well, we have some new leaders at Iowa State University, and just recently, uh, Provost Wickard and I were honored to officially install Dr. Dan Grooms uh, October 20, on October 24th as the new Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Grooms holds the Dr. Stephen G. Julesgard Dean's Chair in Veterinary Medicine, and this endowed position provides perpetual funding for the college priorities. And you can see the provost and I uh, uh, putting that medallion around Dan Groom's uh, uh, neck. Uh, we always joke that you don't wear the medallion to the office every day. It's only for formal occasions. So. And we're also w pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Daniel Rob Robson, Robison as the new endowed Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and Director of the Iowa Agriculture and Home Economics Experiment Station. Uh, Dr. Robison currently uh, serves as Dean of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources and Design at West Virginia University, and he'll officially join us early next year. Well, October was a historic month for Iowa State. This is a photo from our annual Order of the Knoll event held on October 12th, which honors our most generous and loyal donors. And I had the privilege of telling the group that we surpassed our fundraising goal of 1.1 billion nearly two years early. Uh, so we've increased the goal. So we increased the goal for the Forever True uh, for Iowa State campaign to 1.5 billion, and we've extended the campaign one year. It's been such a great campaign, and uh, people were thrilled with the news. I also got to announce two new gifts um, that were very special. Uh, the first was from an anonymous alumni couple who committed the first 20 million for our new Student Innovation Center back in 2015, 
and they've now upped their commitment to $30 million. Isn't that amazing? I, the Student Innovation Center will open in the spring of 2020 and will truly be a state of, an, state of art facility where students can create and innovate and learn how to be an entrepreneur. We also received a $17 million gift to establish the Don Soltz Endowed Fund for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. This is just the core of what we believe we will build into a large endowment uh, to support what we're doing in innovation and entrepreneurship with our undergraduates, with our graduate students, and certainly supporting what our faculty and staff have always been engaged in. And just this week, Boeing announced a $6 million gift that will largely support the Student Innovation Center and what we do in uh, undergraduate research programs. Well, uh, the fall is a beautiful time at Iowa State, but this fall we've only had a few beautiful days like that given the rainy weather. But I will tell you that the beauty of the campus always reflects uh, the beautiful spirit of Thelia Barkeen Rosamina, as you know, uh, who was uh, murdered in a terrible uh, event uh, early in the semester. The campus continues to remember Thelia and to think about her spirit. Uh, we've created an endowed scholarship in her home department of civil and construction and environmental engineering. Thelia was a great student, an exceptional athlete, but most importantly, she was a kind and caring person. So we will always remember Thelia at Iowa State. So it's great pleasure, again, to give you this update. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, resident, or Regent McKibben. I, I was just a senator, not president. <laughs> yeah. Well, Thank you so much for the faculty, or for the staff and the athletes and the coach, the folks that came over to a neighbor town, a little small neighbor town uh, called Marshalltown. I have had so many people come to me uh, as a regent and say, you need to deliver a message to our community uh, of how important that was. And, and uh, I was pleased when I heard the coach say in one of his presentations to to our um, community that uh, this was a teaching moment, he said. And you know, that made me feel really good coming from a, from a coach that says, you know, I'm bringing the whole uh, football staff over to spend a day and learn what you do when, when difficulty ha happens to your communities or, or your areas and how you recover. And I can tell you, I, I was very, very proud and uh, uh, thanked him and I, I wanted to give you that thankful thank, thank, uh, thing today. Thank you very much. We have an exceptional coach in Matt Campbell. He really is about helping our student athletes, the fo the, his football players really learn uh, what it means to become a leader, to become a, a great contributor to a community. Great. Other region? Great. Other comments? Great, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, and now, uh, President Harold, University of Iowa. Thank you. President Richards and members of the board, thank you for this opportunity to update you on the forward momentum occurring on our campus. Before I begin, I want to thank President Nook for hosting us on this wonderful campus. As our faculty and students interact, great things happen. The knowledge obtained and generated from these interactions raises academic quality, creates an environment of excellence for our students and Iowans alike expect. What you see on this screen is a great example of this interaction. Andrew Textor on the left, an electrical engineering student working with Aju Jugasur, the director of our microfabrication facility. Using cutting edge nanotechnology, our faculty and students have developed a coating for a medical stent that could significantly reduce blood clots. In this case, shown here, the stent created was used to relieve the effects 
of a brain aneurysm, but the same technology could be used in stents for the heart or major arteries. Moving ideas to impact is one of the most important effects our university has on our region, state, and the, universe, and the uh, nation. In order, to impact, uh, in order to continue producing better outcomes for our students and Iowans, the university has been moving forward with a plan that is laser focused on quality. The quality of our students, families, Iowans, and patients expect can only be obtained through additional investment in our university. I'm very aware that I must sound like a broken record as every time we have a board meeting, I am commenting about our need to increase resources to the university. If there is one thing I learned in the private sector, it's that you're either moving forward or lagging behind. You're never staying the same. You're either investing new resources and thus adding value and building a winning culture, or you are cutting, reducing value, and creating a downward spiral. Our university is no different. We cannot cut our way to quality. We must continually invest new resources as well as reallocated existing resources. This is why the budget process for an organization like ours is so important. A good budgeting process needs to be transparent, have clear accountability, be flexible, and, con and connect itself to the organization's long-term strategy. Over the past few years, the University of Iowa has been working on implementing just such a budgeting process, and it's now fully implemented and operating as we anticipated. While we still have much to learn, the ability of our academic leadership to plan and fund long-term strategic initiatives has been greatly enhanced. And more importantly, we can now see exactly how all of our resources are being used. We expect this transparency and accountability will also enhance your ability, the board's ability, to hold us accountable as we work to execute against our strategic plan. The university appreciates the strength of our relationship with you and the actions that you have taken as a board surrounding resources, such as setting tuition after the General Assembly determines their level of support, differentiating base tuition between our institutions, and evaluating and supporting the differentiated costs to deliver specific programs. These actions have been and will continue to be of significant assistance to our team as we work to deliver our strategic goals. Thank you. Our strategic plan is our ultimate goal and it is full of unending opportunities as well as, unfortunately, potential failure. We spend each day driving towards that goal by working to make it as far as we can each day racing closer to our goal some days and stepping back a little on others. While we seem to never completely arrive at that goal, we know we are getting closer by regularly measuring our progress. And we're able to move further and further on our journey because of the specific action plans we put in place, coupled with the hard work of dedicated professionals, all focused on driving better outcomes for our students. However, this hard work requires sufficient support from others. As hard as we may try, we simply cannot do it alone. We need dedicated partners who share our commitment to our students' futures. In order to continue to move forward, we must have the necessary resources to invest in these critical actions. Make no mistake, our goals are bold, ambitious, and will require significant support from all of us, from the university, the state, our students, their families, as well as from our faculty and staff. Yet this investment is vital if we are to, one, accelerate our students' careers over the next three or four decades of their lives, two, deliver the research necessary to continue improving the lives of Iowans and Americans, and three, meaningfully increase this region's economic growth. This relentless focus on quality and executing our strategic plan are clearly start, starting to deliver results. For example, one element of our strategy is to hire faculty who can quickly generate increased research grants in key areas. So in the past two years, within the Car Carver College of Medicine and the University of Hosp Hospitals and Clinics, we've added 49 new faculty members, and already these 49 have generated 49.7 
$1.6 million in peer-reviewed NIH funding. The peer-reviewed research metric is exceptionally important for an institution like the University of Iowa because our ability to bring the best and brightest faculty is impacted by our research reputation, which is driven by the peer review process. This is why we are so proud of our overall 16% increase in federal research last fiscal year alone, and in particular the 39% growth in NIH funding, which is directly tied to our new 49 colleagues. This new world-renowned faculty are just increasing are, are, are just increasing the research portfolio of the university, are not just increasing the portfolio of, of the uh, research portfolio of the university. They are also deeply invested in engaging our undergraduates in research. We often view teaching and research as two very different things. Yet they are deeply intertwined, and our faculty often bring their research and scholarship directly into their classrooms. This further enhances the quality of education our students experience and increases student outcomes. For example, the Iowa Neuroscience Institute, which we just started two years ago, already has over 100 undergraduates doing research in our laboratories. The retention and recognition of our top faculty is also a key metric that we're continually focused on as we look to drive results that result in enhanced quality. Recently, we had another faculty member elected to the National Academies, Dr. Ronald Weigel. Dr. Weigel joins 21 other members of the University of Iowa community as part of these extremely prestigious national uh, academies. This distinction is one of the quality met metrics that we track as an institution. As membership in the National Academies illustrates not only professional achievement nationally, but also a deep commitment to service. So Ron, I'm very, very pleased of what you've accomplished and the honor that you bring to our university. I'm also so pleased to note that three of our College of Nursing faculty, Sandra Dack Hirsch, Maria Lindell Joseph, and Susan Van Cleve, were recently named 2018 Fellows of the American Academy of Nursing. The in induction of these three excellent members of our faculty brings the total number of University of Iowa College of Nursing, American Academy of Nursing Fellows to 20. Another measure of quality is the number of citations our faculty obtain during the year. Measuring citations allows the university to calculate the impact of research and measure the quality and impact our research has with, on others within each discipline. This is frankly an area we have been lagging behind, and thus we put a special focus on it in our strategic plan that we developed a few years ago. This is also now starting to pay off as the quality of research and scholarship conducted on our campus saw a 7.2% increase in citations over the past year. Permit me and another example to highlight the importance of immersing our students in interdisciplinary classroom experiences. Learning physics is tough. Learning art, for me in particular, is another. Learning engineering is still another. Learning all three at the same time is something magical and memorable. Pre Professor Yannick, pictured here from our physics and astronomy department, teaches a class for first year students that blends art and physics in order to explore the relationship between these important disciplines. Professor Yannick, along with Professor Young from our Department of Art and Art History, and Deanne Wartman from the College of Engineering expose our freshmen to collaborative scholarship through this class. Exposure to different ways of critical thinking and investigation is a key to opening up new areas of academic exploration for our students. And according to Professor Yannick, Quote, one of the nicest things to see is students mostly interested in the art discover the enormous potential of using computers and vice versa, end quote. Subsequently, this collaboration has led to a project funded by Creative Matches and an art exhibit at St. Ambrose University. Engagement with faculty and their research and scholarship in the classroom drives the outcomes of our students and is exactly what Iowans expect. 
a high quality educational experience that prepares our students for their futures. That experience is measured through engagement and high impact practices, such as undergraduate research, internships, study abroad experiences, just to list a few. Our goal is to have 60% of our graduating seniors experience three or more of these activities by 2021. Last year, we had 62% re reporting at least two or more high impact practices. So we still have some work to do. You might wonder, why is this metric so important? Our experience strongly suggests that the more we connect in classroom discussions with out of class activities, the more our students learn, the faster they graduate, and the higher their GPAs are. While we have increased our four-year graduation by 10 points over the, la the past decade, we still have room to improve in order to obtain our goal of 60% by 2021. Strategies such as these types of high impact practices, as well as additional professional advisors throughout the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences will significantly improve outcomes for our students. Thank you for your continued support and I'd be glad to take any questions you may have. Are there any questions for President Harold? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will have a break for lunch and uh, reconvene at one o'clock.